Thank you so much for your amazing grace. Lord, we thank you so much for who you are and what you've done for us. Lord, thank you for the Sunday school hour. Thank you for the worship time. God, I pray all hearts and minds and ears and heads and everything, Lord, to be clear and, and focused on you and who you are and what you've done for us, Lord, and focused on your word for the next few minutes, Lord, as, as you use um, Brother Rich, Lord, to, uh, to bring it to us. Lord, I thank you so much for what you've done. I thank you for what you're going to do. I thank you for such a great start to a new year. God, I pray, Lord, throughout the rest of this year, Lord, not just today, Lord, we will focus on you and our relationship with you and grow closer to you this year than we ever have before. In your awesome name we pray. Amen. 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 Happy New Year. I think I told just about everybody I got a chance to talk to Happy New Year, but to everybody, Happy New Year. And we hope you've had a great Christmas and a celebration there in your family and around your people of Christmas. And we're glad that we get to start the new year out right here, worshiping the Lord together on New Year's Day. What a great day to be able to do that. Uh, it's a little weird weather-wise outside, but hey, it's Mississippi, what are you going to do? Uh, but it's, a, it's an awesome opportunity for us to, on New Year's Day, while 2023 is still very, very young, for us to think about what God might have for us and what he might have for us to do and who he might have for us to be in this year of 2023. We don't know that he's going to give us all of 2023, but we know he's given us right now to at least step into it. And so with that, we start off a, a short sermon series, a New Year's sermon series called Here We Go Again. Now, here we go again is a phrase that gets used in a lot of ways. It's been used in songs, some very popular and some maybe not as popular. Uh, some of you Mendenhall Tiger fans have been to Poplarville to play a game. Poplarville High School there, they have a particular thing that they do whenever they get a first down, uh, and they're decent, so it happens a good bit, and their, their announcer says, uh, you guys remember? He goes, here we go again, and then the crowd goes, here we go, and it's the most annoying thing when you're in the visitor section to listen to that happen over and over again. Uh, and, but, but here we go again is used in a lot of other ways too, right? Uh, sometimes it can be, well, here we go again. <laughs> More of the same. Same old, same old. Nothing changes. Here, just going through the motions. But you know, here we go again can also be an exciting phrase, right? Here we go again. I think about being younger and, and riding a lot of roller coasters and rides and stuff at amusement parks. And uh, every so often, you'd, you'd find a ride where the line wasn't that long. And so as you're getting off, you'd be passing the line that goes back on. And you'd look at your friend and go, hey, you want to do it again? Yeah, I want to do it again. And you'd run up in there. And then there was that, you'd get in the seat and it'd be like, here we go again. And it was an exciting thing. And I hope for each and every one of us, 
Here We Go Again is an exciting idea for you on New Year's Day of 2023. What are we going to talk about these next two weeks in this short sermon series? Well, we're going to talk about what it is that God might want to do in our lives. Now, I can't tell you specifically what that is in your life. Just like you can't tell me what specifically God wants to do in my life. Because God works in that way. He works specifically in each individual. Yes, he does give blanket commands. Yes, he does set blanket standards. Yes, he does have blanket expectations of all people, and especially of all people who have put their faith in Jesus Christ and have indeed been saved. He has expectations for all of us, but he deals with us specifically. He deals with us very specifically. Your situation, your, con your circumstances, the consequences of your choices, good and bad, are yours, right? Just like mine are mine. I can't prescribe for what's good for me to be good for you, and vice versa. You can't do that for me because we all come from a little bit different situations, a little bit different backgrounds, a little bit different experiences, a little bit different hurts and hang-ups and all the things that come with it. But that's one of the things that makes it so amazing, makes that grace that we've sung about this morning so amazing is that, yes, God tailor fits his work in your life to you. He's not just a one-size-fits-all. He is one Savior that saves all, but He is a personal God. He doesn't change who He is, or doesn't change the truth for you, but He absolutely walks with you and walks with me as individuals in our faith as we step through it. Because all of us are in the same basic area. We're all sinners who, if we've been saved, we've been saved by a holy God, and we are working to do our best to submit more and more of our lives to Him each day, or at least we should be. And, and, and we're all in that boat, but it looks different for all of us. Some of us in the room have been a Christian longer than a lot of the others and have been alive. Some of us are brand new to the faith, and some of us are somewhere in between. But God works personally, and He has something for you. He has something that He has got planned for you in the year 2023. For however long He gives it to us, He has a plan for you. The last thing that the Lord wants for us to do is just go, here we go again, and have it be the same old, same old. Now the good things, the godly things, the things that God is using you to do to minister to people, He wants you to continue those things. But not one of us in this room, not one of us watching at home, not one of us on this planet is doing everything that the Lord has called us to do with no room for improvement. None of us are there. If you think we are, then that's our room for improvement is to realize that we're not. And that's not an indictment against us. That's just the truth of the world. That's just the truth of how holy God is and how he has put holiness in us and it's working its way from the inside of us if he saved us out and making us holier or closer to holy is probably the better way to put that. All of us have room for improvement. God wants to do something in each of us. And this morning, we're going to look at 2 Samuel 24, the last chapter of Samuel's second book, or really the second section of Samuel's book in the Old Testament. Uh, in planning out our sermon series uh, just in the last few months, we're going to actually start in a couple weeks uh, to go through 1 Samuel, half of it at a time over a lot of weeks, and then the other half later on in the year. So we'll, we'll get to read and study and, and hear from God's Word about 1 Samuel throughout this year of 2023, uh, assuming that the Holy Spirit continues to lead in that direction. That's the plan anyway. And so it's, it's interesting that as we started to prepare for this sermon series, he brought us to the end of that part of God's story, right? 1 Samuel starts it all off. It basically takes time uh, to explain the transition from Israel's leading by, by the judges into having a king and then having many kings and all the things that went on with that. And this is going to be towards the end of David's rule and, 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 and towards a time where a lot of things have happened. But in 2 Samuel 24, what's going on is, in the first half of the chapter, the first 17 verses or so, uh, what's happened for a background to our sermon this morning is that David sinned. Now we know that David sins, he's a man after God's own heart, not because he's sinful, not because he does the sin, but because, uh, because he constantly comes back to God. He has a repentant heart, and that's what God would call each of us to have. Not one that doubles down on our sin, but one who realizes our sin and comes to God humbly, submitting ourselves both to his judgment and asking for his forgiveness. David, in this situation, in chapter 24, has decided out of 
a lot of different reasons. We won't go into that this time, but uh, he's decided that he needs to summon up and count up the fighting men of Israel. The prophet comes to him, prophet named Gad comes to him and, and, and says, don't do this, this is probably not the best idea. And yet, David says, go ahead, do it anyway. And we understand that David did this out of vengeful, selfish, angry motivation. And as the king led, well, so the Israelites followed, and so when the king made a bad decision, the Israelites suffered. Now, that didn't mean that the Israelites themselves were not making bad decisions too. It just so happened that their king, who they wanted, uh, would lead them a lot of times into this. And sure enough, God has sent judgment upon David and upon his people because of this sin that David's committed. Uh, because of this arrogance, because of this anger, because of this fleshly rule, he sent judgment. And that judgment from Gad, uh, from, through the prophet Gad, from God, comes to David, and David has three choices. He could have a period of time where he, he has famine in the land, a longer period of time. He could have a shorter period of time where he's going to be run, where the Israelites, and as well as David, are going to be running, being chased, being overcome by enemies. Or there could be a, a period of time, a short period of time, of a plague. David simply says, well, I don't want to be punished by human hands. Let us be punished. Let me be punished by God's hand. So David tells the prophet to tell that to the Lord. The prophet does his job and does so. And God sends the plague. In the first half of chapter 24, 70,000 people in the kingdom of Israel die because of the plague. Terrible, terrible, terrible plague. We know what it's like to go through times of illness, and we know now what it's like to go through times of plague, don't we? We've been through a time in our world here in these last few years. Thankfully, we're coming, I guess, coming out of it. I don't know really how to talk about it anymore, but, but we're no longer in the most acute seeming time of the pandemic. And, and, but we've been there. We know that this is something that has happened to the people of Israel. And now David is saying, I need to repent. David is saying, I need to be right with God. He's doing what David has done even when, from when he was young. Now that he is old, now that he has been king, he is still realizing his sin and repenting. And so he's listening to what God would have him do to make this right. Now before we go too deep into the passage, I want to tell you this. God's not waiting for you to make anything right in your life this morning. God has sent the person of Jesus Christ to make things right. So what does it mean for us? How do we follow what David does in this? We realize our sin and we fall into God's grace and into God's power. We don't try to fix it ourselves. We don't try to do the things that we know to do. We look to what God says to do and we agree to submit to know that he knows better and that his way works better than our way ever could. And we follow that. The sacrifice as we'll see in just a second, the sacrifice that David's going to make has already been made for us. We live in a time where Jesus is that sacrifice. He was that sacrifice. He'll always be that sacrifice. And we don't need to lay any more sacrifices down. What we need to do is submit. And we'll see that here in the passage. Now, all that said, all that background, let's take a look at 2 Samuel verse 24, or excuse me, chapter 24, verse 18. It says, On that day, Gad went to David and said to him, Go up and build an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Arana the Jebusite. So David went up as the Lord had commanded through Gad. When Arana looked and saw the king and his officials coming toward him, he went out and bowed down before the king with his face to the ground. And Arana said, Why has my lord the king come to his servant? To buy your threshing floor, David answered, so I can build an altar to the Lord that the plague on the people may be stopped. Why Arana's threshing floor? What does he have to do with this? Well, in the plague, the angel that was, was delivering the plague, the judgment of God amongst the people, um, was about to destroy uh, or, or bring the plague to the city of Jerusalem. And a lot of people were about to die. God, in his mercy, held that angel's hand. He stayed his hand like he does several times throughout Scripture. He rescued the city of Jerusalem to bring about this repentance. And that angel, instead of just disappearing, he goes and is at Arana's threshing floor. 
This is still a situation before the coming of Christ that God showed himself to be who he is and communicated to his people through prophets, but also through angels. And the word angel literally means messenger. So David, according to what Gad has told him, has gone to the threshing floor of Arana because that is where the plague is kind of currently being held. That's where the angel that is administering the plague that God has put upon his people, that's where he is. And so to make things right, to do what needs to be done, it was specific that he would go there. And that's exactly what David does. We see that in first, in, for us in 2023, as well as for David in making things right here, it all begins with worship. Now folks, let's make sure we're clear on one thing. We love Christian music. We love hymns. We love praise songs. We love choruses. We love things that are done more to be performed before us that we can worship along with and things that we can participate in and sing or even play ourselves and worship that way. But that's only part of worship. We, we talk about all the time, well, who's leading the worship at this event or that event? Well, the Holy Spirit's leading the worship. Somebody might be singing some songs. <laughs> but we get in our mind that worship is music and that everything else that we do in a worship service is something else, preaching or, or, or praying or this or that. No, worship is so much more than just music. And when we say that it all begins with worship, and when we say that for us in 2023, it all needs to begin with worship, it's not, we just need to be singing in 2023. It's not that, hey, we just need to make sure we make our music the best we can, or make a joyful noise in the, in, you know, if you're like me, in the absence of musical skill. No. Worship, when the Bible talks about worship, it's the act of laying ourselves down and exalting God. That's what it means to worship God this morning. Yes, we do that sometimes by singing, but we do that in so many more ways than just singing. It all begins with worship. Let's take a look at it here in verse 18. It said that on that day, Gad went to David and told him, go up and build an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Arana the Jebusite. Here's the thing. Instead of remembering that as a place of sorrow, this place was going to be remembered forever for as long as there were people around there, as a place where God spared them, as a place where God had grace, had mercy, where he delivered them. Like many places throughout the Old Testament where altars were built so that the physical act of worship could be done and the spiritual act of worship could be done. Those places were memorials to God's work. We see that throughout the Old Testament. We'll see it even further past this time in the Old Testament. These altars were there. And so what God is telling David through the prophet Gad is saying, hey, look, I'm going to stop this plague, but I require your worship. He says to go up and build an altar there at that place. So in verse 19, David went up as the Lord had commanded through Gad. David, at this point, his act of worship is not just to build an altar. It's to be obedient to God where he had not been before. It's to do what God said for God's purposes, for God's glory, instead of acting out of what makes him feel right, or acting out of what makes him feel vindicated, or acting out of what makes him feel powerful, or whatever else he might want to tell. He went up, just as the Lord commanded. Just as the Lord commanded is a pretty important phrase in the life of a Christian. Folks, we've all gone through days. We've all gone through seasons in our lives where things have happened. Sometimes it's minor annoyances, sometimes it's major injury. Sometimes it's betrayal, sometimes it's, uh, it's, it's, it's losing faith in other people, sometimes it's, it's this, it's that, it's all, it's all kinds of things that we go through in our life. And every single time we go through those times, we get confronted with how we're going to react. And the battle that is spoken of in the New Testament that constantly rages within us is whether or not we're going to do what our flesh says to do or what the Spirit of God, if we're Christians, says to do. And that battle, that tension is always going on within us. That war, Scripture talks about, is, is happening within us even now as we sit together in this service. It is not natural for us to react and respond to these things in a godly way. It goes against everything that we are, and that's why it's referred to as our flesh, because it's the thing that we've had the whole time we've been here. 
Now, your flesh probably looks a little different now than when you first got here, just like mine does. Some of us have a little bit more flesh <laughs> than we had when we first got here. Some of us have a lot more flesh than when we first got here. But it's the thing that's been with us the whole time. It's the thing that we've been able to see. It's the thing that we think most of the time about ourselves is what we look like. That flesh tells us to get revenge. That flesh tells us to, when others have hurt us, to hurt them. To make sure that we make sure that everybody else gets punished for what they want so that we can have this false sense of justice. Uh, it, it tells us that we should never be treated badly, uh, but we, yet we should be okay and be justified in the ways we may treat other people when they don't, may not be good. Our flesh tells us to do all these things. The Spirit of God is opposite of that. The Spirit of God tells us, no, to love those who persecute us, to pray for those who are our enemies, to go to the people who can't benefit us in any way and to serve them, to love them, to follow God. And isn't that exactly what Jesus has done for us? The only reason we can benefit him is because he has chosen to allow us to benefit him. It's not because he's, you know, he's not going, gosh, well, if I could get the humans to, to like me, I'd be really good as God. No, he doesn't need us. Not for a second, not for a moment, never has. He chooses to desire us to worship him. And so what David does here is, and to, to follow up with that understanding of as the Lord commanded, the Lord commands us to crucify our flesh, to walk in His Spirit, to stop reacting and stop acting out of our own selfish desires, out of our own opinions, out of our own ways of thinking, out of our own traditions or whatever it may be, and to surrender to what His Spirit is doing. And that, when we do that, and as we do that, will allow us to live in our lives specifically as the Lord commands. Until then, we're going to live as we command or as culture commands or as our leaders demand or, or command or whatever, somebody else, but it won't be as the Lord commands. We might do some of the same things that look the same, but we'd be doing them for false and selfish and even sinful reasons. David went up as the Lord commands. For 2023, wouldn't it be something if as a church, if as individuals that make up a church, if we did, as the Lord commanded. Now listen, that doesn't mean that we're going to be perfect. I have no problem admitting to you that I'm not perfect. If you don't, if you don't know that I'm not perfect, ask a few people. They'll tell you how imperfect I am. They know. You can start with my family because they know the most. But here's the thing. God doesn't say, he doesn't command us to be perfect. He commands us to follow him and let his perfection change us towards perfection. And that's the path we're on. That's the path we were on in 2022 and 2021 and going back all the years of our lives since we've been saved. It's the path we're on if God gives us the rest of 2023. As the Lord commanded, like David, still sinners, but following him in repentance and coming to him and growing because of it. In verse 20 it says, When Arana looked around uh, and saw the king and his officials coming toward him, he went out and bowed down before the king with his face to the ground. Well, Aaron is a good Israelite. He's a good, he's a good subject in the kingdom. He sees the king coming. The king doesn't come often. And, and when he does, you're supposed to honor the king. That was just part of being in the kingdom, right? We're supposed to do that with the Lord, and he's always with us. We're supposed to always honor him. But certainly when this earthly king shows up at this, at this man's house, this farmer's house, he, he wants to go and serve the king. First off, he probably is a little afraid. Why is the king coming to my place where I thresh my wheat? What is going on here? And so he throws himself in at the ground, throws himself on the ground at David's feet, and he says in verse 21, Why has the Lord the king come to his servant? Lord, I'm glad you're here, but what's up? <laughs> Why are you here? What am I supposed to do? What are we going to do here? And David says, to buy your threshing floor so that I can build an altar to the Lord that the plague on the people may be stopped. Now listen, Arana is a man who, as we're going to see in the next part of the passage we read, um, wants to serve as king. Think about how this would have gone if he wasn't someone who wanted to serve the king. What could have happened? Arana could have said, oh no. This is my threshing floor. You can't buy it. This is my family's land. This is where we make our livelihood. This is where we get, literally get our food. I can't sell it to you for any amount of money because what are we going to do after that? 
Where are we going to thresh our wheat then? It's not like other people are just giving up land around so we can kind of do that. If somebody came to you, if, and, and the church doesn't do this these days, but if the church came to you and said, hey, we want to buy your house for ministry in the Lord, a lot of us would be like, yeah, you know what? I'm not feeling led that way. <laughs> I don't think that's exactly how we're going to do it, right? Even if we wanted to serve the church, as so many of us do, <laughs> it wouldn't be like, absolutely, let me get the deed. <laughs> you know, That wouldn't be the way that would go. If Arana had been against serving the king, he, he could have done all kinds of things. It probably would have ended up in him losing, but he'd have probably gone down fighting. Thankfully, that's not the way he was. In fact, we're going to see here in just a second that Arana is worshiping God through worshiping the king and through serving him. And it says there in verse 22, it says, Arana said to David, let my lord the king take whatever he wishes and offer it up. Here are oxen for the burnt offering, and here are threshing sledges and ox yokes for the wood. Your majesty, Arana gives all this to the king. And Arana also said to him, may the Lord your God accept you. But the king replied to Arana, No, I insist on paying you for it. I will not sacrifice to the Lord my God burnt offerings that cost me nothing. When David goes to do what God said, he goes, and this is another example of him having a heart like God's, being a man after God's own heart. He goes with a right way of doing it, a godly way of doing it, a way that is true and good in God's eyes. Arana offers him up another option, right? He says, look, I don't have to sell you the land. I will, I'll, but here, you can take any of my oxen. You can take any of my, you can take the land. You can do, God, you know, do what you want. If God wants to use it, you're the king. I'll give it to you. Arana's is a pretty agreeable subject, right? I and mean, we see that here. He says he'll give him everything he needs, even the tools to do it. Arana's saying, look, I'm your servant. I will serve you. And there's a great picture of how we are to be in and of the Lord, taking everything that he's given us and, and turning it right back around for his use and for his glory. Uh, we, we definitely have a lesson to learn there from Arana. But he says, he says, look, let the Lord, the, the king, take whatever he wishes and offer it up. He opens all of his possessions up. And he's saying, he's not saying no don't take the land, he's saying, don't, you don't have to buy it. I'll just give it to you. Not many of us would make that decision, right? That wouldn't be a lot of our response. The church came and asked, or let's, let's put it this way, let's, say, let's take the church out of it. What if the government came and said they were going to take your property? Eminent domain, it's happened before, hadn't it? It happens for the good of you know, a lot of people, but it hurts somebody. <laughs> it hurts the people who lose the land. How many people have said, hey, you know what, it's for the betterment, it's for what, you know, what needs to happen, take it, go ahead. In fact, let me help you, let me help you move my stuff out. <laughs> that doesn't go on, does it? But that's exactly what's happening here. He's going to give it to God. He's going to give it to God's king of God's people. Verse 24 says, but David, the first half of it says, but the king, David, replied to Arana, no, I insist on paying you for it. I will not sacrifice to the Lord my God burnt offerings that cost me nothing. What we see here is, is what costs nothing means nothing. I've heard it said this way. If God answered every one of your prayers today, would it impact anybody other than you? Would it impact anybody other than your immediate family? If God literally did whatever you wished, who would it help? Thinking in terms of a new year, looking back on the years that God has given us already, what does our faith in Him cost us? We know what it cost Him. He sent His only Son to die on the cross, and Jesus, the Son Himself, gave His life didn't hold anything back, didn't halfway die, didn't mostly die. He died fully for you and for me. He gave everything, didn't hold anything back. It has cost God everything to save you and me. And he willingly did it. And he asked the question, what does our faith cost us? 
You see, there's a way of, of Christianity that, that is not true Christianity, but it's definitely a Christianity that people live in and that they think is, is the right thing, where Christianity is there to help us when we hurt, to make us feel better when we messed up, to provide for us when we're in need, and, and, and we can kind of get along, take all that and just do our thing. And out of that comes a very selfish type of Christian. And those very selfish types of Christians are usually the ones where people look at them often and go, and you're a Christian? Why would I want to be like that? And we end up, if we're that way, hurting the kingdom instead of serving the kingdom. Now sometimes, sometimes, as we all mess up, we might have moments of those things in our life, but some people have built their entire character about that. Because to them, Christianity, their faith, doesn't cost them anything. They walked an aisle when they were young. They went through the waters. They've gone to church a long time. They, they do some things. They might give. They might serve. They might do this and that here and there, but that's all. It doesn't really get in the way of the rest of their desires. It doesn't really get in the way of the rest of their lives. That's not the biblical understanding, the biblical promise of Christianity. What costs nothing means nothing. If our faith costs us nothing, Biblically speaking, not my judgment, not your judgment, and our judgments on the matter really doesn't matter at all. If our faith costs us nothing, it means nothing. If our faith costs us nothing, if we can say that we're saved and look no different than if we weren't, we're probably, well, I won't say probably, I'll just let the Lord speak. We're not saved. Now, if that bothers us, I'm sorry. Because it bothers me sometimes too, because I fall into the same thing. But that's not one person saying to another person what they think. That's what God's Word tells us. If it costs nothing, it means nothing. David says to Arana, he doesn't really even stop to say thank you, but there's, there's, there's gratitude implied in what he says, I believe. He says, look, thank you for giving, be willing to give this. But the reason I'm buying this is not just to have another fancy altar. The reason I'm buying this is because the Lord has called me to repent, and this is the way he's called me to repent. And the biblical understanding of repentance means giving up what we are so that we can become what God is and what he would have us to be. David understood that. We need to understand that. You came to church this morning on New Year's Day. On New Year's Day, we're so glad and we're glad to see you and we're thankful. But that doesn't mean you're saved or not. Anybody can get up and go anywhere at almost any given time. What would you come with? Did you come with an attitude, with an opportunity that God would give you, or, or with a desire that God would give you an opportunity to grow in him today? Are you marking time now to see when I'll shut up so you can go to lunch? Now, we joke about it a lot, but that just means because some of us really feel that way. I understand. Or are you sitting there thinking, you know what, God's word's going to be opened up, Sunday school and worship service, God's name's going to be praised, God's, God's will is going to be asked for in prayer, maybe he'll do something new. If that's, if that's what you come with, that's when you see God move. When you don't come with that, all you see is what everybody else does. And what everybody else does will always disappoint you. It'll always upset you. It'll always be not good enough. It'll always be this. It'll always be that. Nobody will ever be satisfied. But when we come willing, knowing that what costs nothing means nothing, willing to put down my time, put down my opinion, put down even what I think I know to hear what God has to say. Forget a preacher, forget a song leader, forget a Sunday school teacher, but what God has to say through his word. That's when you start to see him move. That's when all of a sudden the focus is not so much on the person talking or the other people listening, but it's on the God who's speaking. And that's when he brings us to the point where we're willing to lay things down. Where we're willing to let it cost us something to serve him who it cost everything to give us the opportunity to serve. David says, no, I won't, I won't offer up these offerings that cost me nothing. He goes on to say in the next part of verse 24, it says, so David bought the threshing floor and the oxen and paid 50 shekels of silver for them. He paid above and beyond. He paid more than the market price. Verse 25 says, David built an altar to the Lord there and sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings. And then the Lord answered his prayer in behalf of the land, and the plague on Israel was stopped. When we 
live as God calls us to, that is when he changes our understanding, our desires to be his desires, and that's when he starts to show us just what only he can do for us and in us and through us. You see, the last point this morning is this, is that God responds. God responds, but he doesn't respond to our faith that costs nothing because our faith that costs nothing means nothing. Why would God be moved by that? Why would God owe that any allegiance? Not that he ever owes us anything, but why would he, why would he work in light of that? In fact, if we're ones who our faith costs us nothing, he's working to defeat that in our lives. He is working in his spirit to convict us of that, not to punish us, not to tell us how bad we are, but to bring us into a point where we will sacrifice whatever we have, whoever we are, whoever we've been, what other people think of us, to do what God tells us to do. What God tells us to do will always line up with his word. When we do that, when we are those people, we will see God responding and we'll live a life of faith in a way that we never have. And in 2023, my encouragement to you, and I believe God's call to all of us is, let's not start off just going, well, here we go again. Let us have the understanding of here we get to go again. God's given us another year, and there's more that he wants to do in us and more that he wants us to do in and for him, and there's more that we can do to bring other people in the Harrisville community and anywhere else we can be to come to know Jesus, not just to come and do things the way we do them here and the way we've done them here, but to know the living God and to be saved and to serve him so that others can be also. What if in 2023... Every one of us, not just the preacher, not just the deacons, not just the servants in the church, every one of us who warm these pews so many Sunday mornings, what if every one of us said, God, I want to give it all to you. And I want it to cost me. I, want, I don't want to do these sacrifices. I don't want to go to church and have it cost me nothing and have it mean nothing. God, I want to see you respond when I respond as you call me to. The first way we do that is we give our faith to Jesus. He's our Savior. He's our only Savior. He's our only hope. And he's the one who's come into this world that we might have salvation, that we might even have an opportunity to honor and to glorify God. This morning, if you've not put your faith in Jesus, I'd love to have a conversation with you. Maybe right now you don't need to have a conversation with me. Maybe God's telling you, hey, it's time you got saved. You can give your life to him right now and just come down and tell us about it when you're ready. We'll celebrate it with you. But if you're not there yet, if you'd like to talk about it, I'd love to sit down with you. You name the day, you name the time. We can do it today. We can do it, to, we can do it whenever. I'd love to talk to you about how you can give your life to Jesus and be saved. I know looking out in this room, many of us are saved. Many of us have put our faith in Jesus but many of us have fallen in, in the years recently in our lives, maybe for a lot of years, it doesn't matter. It doesn't really matter how long, but we've been guilty of this. Where instead of worrying about how much we can give to God in our faith, we worry about how little we have to give, what little we have to do, what little obligation we must have. And we started looking at everybody else a lot more than we've, started, than we've been looking at God and what he calls for us. This year, could we say that God is giving us another chance, as we'll talk about next week. He's giving us another chance to have a new year. Not just a new year on the calendar, but a new year in him, serving him. If you're saved this morning, the encouragement and the invitation is this to you. Would your faith cost you even closer? It will never cost you everything, but will it cost you closer to what it costs God to give it to you? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord God, we thank you this morning, Father, that you have sacrificed everything for us. And even in this passage that we've read and discussed this morning, Lord God, you have, you have relented, you have shown grace, you've shown mercy, even though it wasn't something you had done wrong, but something your people had done. Father God, we thank you that that's true. You've shown us grace, shown us mercy, and given us the opportunity for forgiveness through sending Jesus, whether we ever accept him or not. Lord God, if there's any in this room who have not put their faith in Jesus, let them do so now. Let them, if they're not ready to do that, let them take a step by having a conversation with me or someone else they're comfortable with that knows you through faith in Jesus Christ about how they can be saved. Lord God, for us as people who are saved this morning, let us start this new year with joy, with gladness, and Father, with sacrifice. Father, more than just our, our offering or our tithes, more than just our, our showing up, but Father, with you changing our hearts to line up that we would all look more and more like you. 
and that we would all look more to you in this year that you've given us. Father God, whatever you want to do in our hearts, let us respond to you during these few moments and during every moment you give us as we worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please stand. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thy all in all. Jesus paid it all. Thank you for another day and another year, Lord, and just thank you for letting us all have another opportunity to come to your house to worship you as a church family, and just help us as we start this new year to, to look to your word and to be able to use uh, Brother Richard's preaching to, to glorify your gospel, Lord, and take these tithes and, and use them to, to enhance your kingdom, Lord. Amen. <laughs> This morning for our ministry spotlight, just want to make sure you're aware of a couple of things going on as far as schedule. How many of you are experiencing kind of that holiday hangover where all the different things have gone on, all the gatherings and, and this going here and doing that, and you're trying to figure out, now what does Monday look like? How does that actually work? Some of you get a holiday tomorrow, 
uh, and, and excited to, to let you celebrate that. Uh, but, uh, but in the service schedule and all that, as we went through Christmas, we're, today we're back to normal. So we'd love to have you this evening at 5 o'clock for children's and youth activities, Bible study, all of our normal things. And then as far as I know, we'll be on regular schedule here for a while after a lot of craziness over the holidays. So we're excited about that. Hope you'll come back. Deacons, that does mean that we'll have our deacons meeting at 3.30. Um, so, uh, so just uh, you know, come on up and we'll, and we'll get that done. And uh, that'll keep us on track for January. As, uh, as our chairman uh, you know, and I talked about to decide. So we're glad to, uh, to get back to that. Uh, one thing that happens, and I don't know if it's happened at your house or not, but it's got to happen in this house is you got to take down decorations, right? <laughs> Anybody already got their house, their living room, their, their fireplace back to normal? All right. Oh, oh, good. Y'all, y'all have had some time this holiday season. Good for y'all. All right. I'll come help me. Talking to you guys over here, we're, we're all still waiting, right? That Christmas tree may stay up. I, every year this time, I'm like, would it hurt to leave it up year-round? I mean, why not? It's, it's there. Anyway, uh, but we are going to have a group come up uh, tomorrow at 4 o'clock p.m. Uh, and, and take down the decorations here in our sanctuary around the rest of the church. So if you'd like to pitch in and help with that, come on up at 4. won't take long. The more we got, the, the quicker it'll go. Uh, but we'll be tearing down decorations, kind of putting things back to normal and getting ready to settle in to a new year of ministry. So we're so glad that you've been here with us this morning. If you've been watching at home, we wish you, as well as the folks that are here, Happy New Year. Hope you have a great day. We look forward to seeing you more and more this year as God leads us to serve him together. See ya. Amen. Two things real quick. First, um, thank you all for those that prayed for, for our youth. They had an awesome, safe trip. Um, it's like God had our, his hand on us the whole time. We got up there the day after it snowed, and it was kind of melting, so that's good. We didn't have to drive in it. Um, also, for, on behalf of uh, Brandy, she's in the nursery right now, and her mom, we'd like to thank the Brotherhood for the awesome ramp they built for, for her. She... For those of you that don't know, y'all pray for her. She, she fell and broke her ankle in two places. And so she's at St. Dee's now. And she'll be in Simpson um, Wednesday, I think. Just keep her in your prayers. But I just wanted to say that. Thank you so much. You know, it's awesome to be a part of a church that, 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 is, that is a church <laughs> that acts and, you know, that does stuff for people like the food pantry and, and stuff. But that we're, you're not church in name only. You're church in deed. And I'm not just saying that because y'all built my mother-in-law a ramp. I'm just saying that because... That's just, it's just awesome to be a part of a part of a community, a part of a church that looks out for one another and loves one another and treats each other like family. Amen. Speaking of family, please stand. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family.